And uh, welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia Online. My name is Jason Freeman, and I'm pleased to be here to introduce tonight's guest, Randall Kennedy. Celebrated for his courage and his convictions in tackling sensitive issues, Randall Kennedy is what the Washington Post calls a, quote, member of that small coterie of our most lucid big thinkers about race. The Michael R. Klein professor at Harvard Law School, he formerly held positions at the United States uh, Court of Appeals and at the U.S. Supreme Court, where he cl clerked for Thurgood Marshall. His many books include Interracial Intimacies, The Persistence of the Color Line, For Discrimination, and so on. He's here tonight with his new book, Say It Loud. In it, he offers a collection of provocative essays in topics ranging from George Floyd, birtherism, Clarence Thomas, anti-racism, and more. A review in the New York Times states that in almost everything about his views on race in America, Kennedy is both resolutely temperate and probably right. Uh, so let's hop to it. Randall, thank you so much for being here. And uh, the screen is all yours. Thank you very much. I appreciate your offering this forum to me. And I look forward to interacting with uh, our audience after I say a bit about uh, this collection of, of essays that has recently been published. Um, I'm gonna proceed by just describing some of the, the essays in this book. Uh, say It Loud is a collection of 29 essays they are pieces that were written over the past 20 years. Uh, some of the pieces, many of the pieces have been published before, um, but I, I've, I've gone over all of them, even the ones that have been published before, and I've, I've revised, I've updated, um, I've corrected. Um, on occasion, I have, uh, apologize for what I think were, were misjudgments, previous misjudgments. So all of these essays really do contain my thinking um, as of my current thinking. Uh, but I've, I've, I've certainly been um, happy to indicate places where my mind has changed uh, over the years. But let me mention a couple of the essays uh, in this book. Let me begin with the, uh, the first essay. The first essay is called Shall We Overcome Optimism and Pessimism in, in, in African American Racial Thought? And what I say in this essay is that um, racial thinking among Black Americans um, can be situated into uh, two camps. You can, this is just one way of trying to make sense of the, the very broad spectrum of African-American thinking. There are other ways, of course, in which one could try to make sense of this, you know, this, this, this broad spectrum, this highly varied spectrum of thought, but this is just one way of doing it. And so what, what I say in this essay is that you can you, you, can, you can discern two uh, broad camps. One camp is the camp that says, that answers, uh, yes, we shall overcome. It's the optimistic tradition, the tradition that believes that uh, we can in this country overcome the, the history of, of racism, the history of racial oppression and that uh, we can become um, uh, a, uh, a multiracial republic in which people are considered equals. That's one view. Um, another view is a, a pessimistic view. It's the point of view that says, no, we should not overcome that uh, racial hierarchy is baked into American life uh, and that racial hierarchy will prevail. It will continue. Uh, there will be no racial equality uh, in the United States. There will not be a happy ending to the uh, American racial saga. Now, 
let me go a little bit further into these two different camps. The optimistic camp um, is, uh, well, in the 19th century, the great spokesperson for the optimistic camp would be Frederick Douglass. Uh, Frederick Douglass, even before the abolition of slavery, even before the abolition of slavery, Frederick Douglass was asked once, do, do you, can you foresee a time when people of different races will view one another as equal neighbors? Do you see such a time? And he answered, yes, yes, I do. Now, this is before the abolition of slavery, and this is coming from a person who you know, bore the, the scars of slavery. This man was, of course, enslaved, ran away from slavery, knew slavery intimately, knew racism intimately, but he was an, he was an optimist. He said that you know, things can change, people can change, um, we shall overcome. In the, um, so Frederick Douglass in the 19th century, in the 20th century, the great spokesperson of in the optimistic tradition. There are a number of people, but if you, you know, one person that I think stands out would be Martin Luther King Jr. Think of I Have a Dream. Or think of, so I Have a Dream, probably his most well known uh, utterance, but then one might also um, point to the, uh, his last speech as a civil rights leader uh, when he talked about uh, right you know hours hours before he's killed you know i've 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 been to the mountaintop and i've seen the promised land i might not get there with you but i've seen the promised land i mean he you know he, he has in mind overcoming he has in mind reaching the promised land in the 21st century probably the most consequential racial optimist, was uh, Barack Obama. Um, Barack Obama, aware of you know, racial oppression, um, but yes, we can. And uh, think, of, think of the night that uh, he was elected president of the, you know, the United States. Uh, all things are possible in America. Uh, very optimistic. Um, the pessimistic camp. And the pessimistic camp, in a way, the pessimistic camp is more interesting, actually, than the optimistic camp. Uh, it certainly has a broader range of people. In the uh, pessimistic camp, on the one hand, you have people like, um, well, Alexis de Tocqueville. Alexis de Tocqueville, obviously not, not a black American thinker. Um, there are a number of white American thinkers that um, white Americans or, or whites, Tocqueville, of course, from France, uh, who, who thought hard about the race question in America. And I, I, I talk about them and bring them uh, uh, into in my dis, into my discussion about Black American thinkers, my point is a number of just like there 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 have been there have been there were whites who were in the optimistic tradition. I didn't mention them, but there are whites in the optimistic tradition. There are whites in the pessimistic tradition. Among the most pessimistic thinkers about race are white observers. So Alexis de Tocqueville in Democracy in America. Um, de Tocqueville had a chapter called The Three Races of America. It was it, the three races that he discussed, whites, blacks, Native Americans. And it's a very dark vision. De Tocqueville said, no, there won't be racial equality in the United, in the United States. Never. Uh, even after slavery is done away with, there's, there's, there's not going to be racial equality. And his basic theory was that the conjunction, the confluence of, on the one hand, racial difference, clear racial difference, and slavery. So if you put those two things together, 
even after slavery is abolished, people will know who were the folks who were enslaved. He said, you know, he, he basically said, I, I, I come from an aristocratic society. I come from a society that knows about pecking orders. But he said, you know, in a, in a, in a society in which you can't tell who was who, just right off the bat. You can't just look at somebody and look at their, their you know, the, the, the color of their skin and tell who was who. He said, well, under those circumstances, with enough, you know, change in society, enough time has passed, you don't know who was relegated to the lowest orders. But he said, you're going to always know that in America. So he had a very dark view. Other pessimists, um, Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson, in his uh, notes on the state of Virginia, said, we're never, we're never going to have uh, racial equality in America. The, the people who were enslaved will always remember. They'll have a thousand memories of the horrors of enslavement. And uh, the whites will have the memory, too. Very Jefferson, very dark view. No, we're not gonna. We're not gonna. We're not gonna overcome. Uh, Abraham Lincoln. One of the reasons why Abraham Lincoln was very interested in colonization I mean, throughout throughout his adult life, very interested in colonization, was because he did not think that whites and blacks could occupy the United States on an equal basis. Uh, and you know, live together uh, in harmony. So he was always very interested in the idea of black people going someplace else, going you know, back to Africa, going to Panama, going, going someplace, um, but not staying in, in, in America. And, and you know, he thought that he, this was actually for the good of everybody, but especially for black people, because he didn't think that white people would ever accommodate themselves to being um, on an equal basis with, with black people. Among black Americans um, in the uh, pessimistic tradition, you have black nationalists, you know, Marcus Garvey, um, Elijah Muhammad, the Nation of Islam. I mean, you know, in the black, na in, in at least in a large faction of black nationalist thinking, you have people who say, no, this is, you know, this, this is a white man's, this is a white man's country, has been from the beginning, um, will continue to be a white man's country. Therefore, black people need to do something else. Black people need to either have sort of some sort of inward migration and develop a certain, you know, uh, a, a separate identity within the United States or leave the United States. I and mean, there are plenty of black people who have, there's certainly been plenty of efforts to leave the United States. And so in my essay, I go through all of that. Now, where am I? Where am I on this? This issue, this, you know, optimism, pessimism, has a deep uh, personal meaning to me because, um, because largely because of my father. My father was a thoroughgoing pessimist, thoroughgoing pessimist. My father was born in uh, Louisiana and uh, had a very tough upbringing and saw many terrible things. And um, he endured racist affronts. Um, one of the racist affronts that I know left a, a scar with him had to do with the treatment of black American soldiers uh, in World War II. Uh, you know, he, 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 he he would talk about how you know, black American soldiers wearing the uniform of the United States, being willing to risk serious injury, even death in defense of the United States. Those soldiers were told that they could not go to places 
where white German prisoners of war were allowed to go. My father thought that the United States of America had betrayed black Americans. And he was not willing to forget or forgive what he perceived to be that terrible betrayal. And so he, um, he, he, he did not think we would overcome. He had a very dark vision. And um, we talked about this as I was, you know, in, in my household as, we were, as I was growing up. So I was very um, aware of the pessimistic tradition. Um, one wonderful thing about my dad, he had very strong feelings, but he was not dictatorial. He wanted his children to be educated and he wanted them to develop ideas of their own and he gave space for the generation of alternative ideas. And I grew up um, becoming generally an optimist and I have remained uh, part of the optimistic camp, believing that the general trajectory of black America has been a, a trajectory up and, you know, up. Um, John Hope Franklin's wonderful book on black American history from slavery to freedom. That's generally been my view. And uh, I'm, a, I'm a fan of the, the um, I, I, I revere the champions of racial justice. And my sense is that, uh, you know, America, of course, has had a, a, a terrible history. But that's not all there is. It also has a glorious history of struggle against racism. There has been a long tradition of racists, but there's also been a long tradition of anti-racists. And through heroic, persistent, intelligent struggle, things have made, been made better. So I've generally been an optimist. I end this essay by talking, however, about how I have been shaken over the past few years. Um, I thought we were further down the road to racial decency than we are. Um, the, frankly, the, the ascendancy of Donald Trump and the racial ideas that uh, he tapped and that he encouraged, that he tolerated. I was really quite taken aback by that. I don't think I was sentimental. I knew that I knew that uh, you know there was there were racial resentments around, of course, but I did not know that those racial resentments, would be as um, powerful as we have seen that they are. And um, so I, I, I still put myself in the optimistic camp, but I don't have the confidence that I once had. I'm, 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 I'm shaken with my, 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 my optimism has been shaken and um, a few years ago, I used to be rather chastising toward people who, you know, were, were basically pessimists. And um, I've, I've, I've had to change my, the, the, the tenor of my discussion of this issue. Uh, unfortunately, it's, 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 it's tragic. I, I, I think that, um, I, I see our present and our future with a, in a, with a, with a, with, through a prism that is tinctured with, with more uncertainty, tinctured with more tragedy 
than uh, in previous years. So that was, you know, that that's that was the the first essay, and it's one of the longer essays, and I think it's one of the more important essays uh, in the book. Let me talk about my second one. Second essay in the book is an essay called Derek Bell and Me. This is an essay that has has never has never been published before. I spent a lot of time on this essay. Let me just spend just a little bit of time talking about Derek Bell and me. Derek Bell was the first black tenured professor at Harvard Law School. And he's been in the you know he's been in the news lately because many people pe you critical race theory, well, Derek Bell is viewed by many who call themselves critical race theorists as sort of the, the godfather of critical uh, race theory. And um, I, I have written an essay in which I discuss his ideas and I discuss my relationship with him. Uh, when I joined the faculty of Harvard Law School, he, he was actually not there. He had been on the faculty. But when I came, he had, he had left. He had left to become the dean of the University of Oregon Law School. And that's where he was for my first few years on the faculty at Harvard Law School. And then he came back. And when he, when he came back, we, you know, we, we met, we talked, we were, uh, we were friendly. Um, I had basically taken over a course that he had created. He had a course at Harvard Law School, popular course, well-known course, Race, Racism, and American Law. And um, I started teaching that course, and I started writing articles about race relations law. And again, our relationship was so, was an interesting relationship, because on one level, um, we were friends, close friends. For one thing, we, we shared a, we had a, we had a, a tie that was a tragic tie. His first wife uh, died of, uh, because of, of, of cancer. And my wife of blessed memory was a cancer surgeon. And uh, Professor Bell's wife was not one of my wife's patients, but we knew them and uh, you know, my, my, my wife talked with, with, with Mrs. Bell quite a bit, and we'd, we'd go visit in the hospital. And then uh, years later, well, his, his wife died, and then years later, my wife passed away. So we, 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 we had that in common, and we had other things in common, and we, we, we talked, and we were quite friendly. He was uh, very, he was, he was nice to me as a uh, senior colleague. He encouraged me, he encouraged my work. Um, uh, he opened doors for me. And I was, you know, very appreciative of that. The difficulty, or at least one difficulty, is that um, I, my, my views really diverged from his. Um, so one, big divergence was that um, over time he developed an idea. He was a pessimist. You know, I talked about the pessimist tradition. Uh, Derek Bell was a very important voice in the pessimistic tradition in the 20th century. He had a view, his view was that, uh, you know, um, Pigmentocracy in America was a, was a permanent condition. He was an activist. He was uh, all for struggling to change things. But he basically said, we need to struggle just as an ethical matter. You need to, we need to struggle. We need to try to see that justice is done. But his view was, realistically speaking, Justice is not going to be done in America. We shall not overcome. Well, I criticized his views, and I said, well, 
you know, um, over the course of, you know, you're not going to tell me that there's no difference between the race, racial landscape in 1970, as opposed to, let's say, 1950. I mean, you know, what about the Civil Rights Act of 19? 57, Civil Rights Act of 1960, Civil Rights Act of 1964, Voting Rights Act of 1965, Open Housing Act of 1968. What about Brown versus Board of Education, Loving versus Virginia, on and on and on. Um, clearly, there has been change in America, not as much as we would like, to be sure. But the idea that there's really been that, you know, the changes that have happened are, 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 are mere, merely peripheral. Uh, they don't really amount to a whole lot. I thought that that was, I thought that was untenable and, and, and I said so. And there were other ways in which we really differed, uh, you know, sometimes quite sharply. And um, he took after me in print and I took after him in print. And um, it, it, it led to some hard feelings. And in this essay, I, I talk about our relationship. So for instance, just one more thing with this. Um, I wrote a piece once in which I criticized some of his thinking. I criticized the thinking of some other people who are identified now with you know, critical race theory. And I sent him my article ahead of time uh just you know to get his views you know here's what i've written i'd be really interested in in your reactions and he and he wrote me a letter back and he said he gave me his reactions and then he said um i urge you strongly not to publish this uh, the ideas that you voice will be harmful um and I, you know, you, you don't need to publish it. Don't, don't publish it. Well, I published it. And he really held that against me. And uh, I, I, I talk about why I published it and all of that. Let me, let me give the ending. The ending of the essay talks about our, um, my, the way we ended up. Late, very late in his life, I, I heard that um, I heard that he was very ill, and I called him up, and uh, I, you know, I basically said, you know, listen, I, I, I hear you're under the weather, but you know, do know that from afar, I'm, 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 I'm pulling for you, and we had a very nice talk, and then a little, then a, a bit later, he called me up and he said, listen. I'm, I'm, you know, really quite ill. Um, I, uh, I would, I'd be interested, would you be interested in teaching um, a, uh, a session of a seminar that I'm giving? By this time, he had left Harvard Law School. He famously resigned from Harvard Law School as a, as a, in, in protest. Harvard Law School, when he resigned, had not uh, did not have any um, black women on its faculty, and he gave, he he put down an ultimatum. He said, "Listen, uh, Harvard Law School, by a certain time, you better have hired a black woman, and if you have not, um, I'm 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 not going to I'm not going to teach anymore." And 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 he 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 stood by his ultimatum and and ultimately left Harvard Law School. He went to New York University Law School, and that's where he was teaching at the end of his career, at the end of his life. And I, I went to teach this session, um, and I taught it, and I, I taught it one week after he had passed away. But we, we did have one final conversation on the phone, and, and I, I was able to express you know, my, my gratitude to him and my deep respect for him. And I think we, at the very end, um, I, I think we were able to reach a reconciliation, which was very meaningful to me. 
And one of the reasons why I wanted to write this essay is it was, it was my effort to show, pay my respects to Derrick Bell. And one of the ways in which I wanted to pay my respects to him was to be open, be con you know, be candid, um, say where I agreed with him, but also say where I disagreed with him. I think you show respect to a thinker by taking their ideas seriously, seriously enough to criticize. And uh, that's what I attempted to do uh, in this essay. There are a bunch, well, like I said, there are 29 essays. Um, there's an essay about the events of last, last summer, the George Floyd moment, Promise and Peril. There's an essay about the um, struggles on various university campuses regarding memorialization. Do you keep the name, you know, John C. Calhoun? That was an issue at, at Yale. Do you keep the name at my alma mater, Princeton University? Do you keep the name Woodrow Wilson? Or you, do you demote the name? Do you take the name off of a school, off of a building? This is an issue that's come up over and over at various places, and I, I give my ideas about that. Um, I talk about uh, Justice Clarence Thomas, whom I harshly criticize. Uh, I have an essay, well, I think the title will give you a hint of where I stand, Why Clarence Ta Thomas Ought to Be Ostracized. Um, I have a long um, piece about uh, the great Thurgood Marshall. And I really, I, I, I got a lot of pleasure out of writing that piece. I, I clerked for Justice Marshall in the 1983-1984 Supreme Court term. It was one of the highlights of my life. And I, uh, I talk about Thurgood Marshall's career uh, in, in that essay. And again, there, there, there are other pieces in this uh, collection. But I think I've, I've given you a, a sufficient, I've been talking long enough, I've given you a, um, a, a sufficient sense of the, the sorts of things that I, I, I cover in this, um, in this collection. And why don't we now turn to uh, your questions and um, turn this uh, monologue into a dialogue. Thank you so much for listening to me. And now I look forward to uh, interacting with you through questions, answers, and by all means, objections. I, I can imagine that maybe some of you object to something that I've said or object to something that I've written, and the, the, the floor is open to objections as well. So thank you. Okay. Oh, I brought my gavel here so I can overrule any objections. So here we go. Uh, let's see. Um, Marianne, uh, okay, here, here's a softball to begin with. Perhaps a bit off, to, and I'm just going straight down the list. Uh, perhaps a bit off topic, but I'm curious who the artist of the pieces, uh, who painted the uh, the pieces that are behind you. Those are um, Romare Bearden, and uh, those are Romare Bearden prints. My uh, my wife of blessed memory was was uh, was an was an artist as well as a surgeon, and was you know the the, the art world was a, was a big interest of hers and. So that's that's what's in back of me. Um, okay, so uh, in the spirit of uh, Absalom Jones uh, of the Free African Society, Richard Allen of the AME Church. It, okay, softball straight to straight to in depth question. Uh, fifth uh, of the fifth Pan Am uh, Pan African uh, Congress, nineteen forty five, Black Political Convention. Um, Okay, so the question here is, were you present, this is a very specific date, Monday, October 16th, 1995 in Washington, D.C., uh, and what are your thoughts about the resilience of African people in America? Uh, what thoughts can you glean from these through lines? So I, I, think there's, I think there's a lot of questions in here. Not altogether sure what the, the question yeah. is. I, 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 I mean, the references were to uh, you know, I, I guess 
a version of the black nationalist tradition. And um, like I said, in, in my essay on optimism and pessimism, I talk about the black nationalist strain within the pessimistic tradition. Um, on the question of you know, resilience, black Americans have shown absolutely remarkable resilience. And um, you know, the, the, the story of black Americans is a remarkable story, not only in terms of American history, it's remarkable in terms of world history. I mean, 1865 is not really that long ago. You really think about it. 1865, not that long ago. In 1865, um, four, there were four million black people had recently been released from you know, hereditary bondage. Four million black people, hereditary bondage, had been prevented, it was against the law in many, many slave jurisdictions, it was against the law to teach black people how to read or write had a half million, approximately a half million free, but four million, there have been, there have been about a half million free blacks during the age, of, you know, in, in the, the end of the slavery era, but four million who had been in bondage. And take a look at what has occurred. Take a look at what that group of people has been able to do in the face of tremendous resistance, I mean, you you have the abolition of slavery, you have you have re, you know you have Reconstruction, Thirteenth Amendment, Fourteenth Amendment, Fifteenth Amendment. You have that relatively brief period of time where in which uh, black people become, or at least black men are allowed to become politically active as voters, as office holders. You have a relatively brief period, and then redemption. You have this, this terrible, this destructive reaction that throws Black people back. But, you know, Black people get it together and uh, are able to husband their resources, organize, and um, build a movement that leads to a second reconstruction. And, you know, I mean, I, I think that that's important to remember. It's important to remember the obstacles. It's also important to remember the overcoming of the obstacles. So, you know, with, with your, your question about you know, black people and, res and resilience, black people have shown absolutely remarkable uh, resilience and have a story that is a, uh, filled with heroism, filled with beauty, uh, filled with a, um, uh, a desire for uh, decency, uh, for human realization, for everyone. There are so many things that are part of American life that are attributable to black people's struggles. So let me, let me talk about another essay that's in my, in my book, one that I had a lot of, I had a lot of fun uh, writing. It's, um, it's called, um, let's see here. Yeah, the sixth essay, how black students brought the Constitution to campus. I mean, for any student, in, in, before 1960, before 1960, students at public universities had virtually no constitutional rights. Uh, as a matter of law, a student at a public university could be tossed out by the authorities at the university 
anytime. Students were basically on campus at will. This changed, this changed in the early 1960s. The key case, sort of the breakthrough case, was a case called St. John Dixon versus Alabama State Board of Education. What happened was uh, St. John Dixon and some other black students at Alabama State College engaged in a sit-in. They went to a, a courthouse this was in Montgomery, Alabama. They went to a courthouse, and in this courthouse was an eating facility that was segregated. They sat in to protest that. The, the, the governor of the state heard about this, calls up the president of Alabama State College and says, uh, throw these students out, expel them. And the governor made it clear that he meant business, that unless these students were immediately expelled, the institution would, would be put in danger. So the president, the president expelled them. They fought that. Uh, they, took, they took the university to court. They took the state to court. They lost in the, at the federal district court level, but then they appealed their case to the United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit. And the United States Court of Appeals reversed the district court and said, you know what? These students were at least, they, the students were entitled to at least a hearing. Not clear that they're going to prevail, but they are at least entitled to a hearing. You can't just summarily expel them. That was the beginning of the idea that students at public universities have constitutional rights. One more case, four years later, this was in 1960, the case that I just mentioned, four years later in 1964, some high school students in Mississippi, black high school students, go to school wearing a button, a freedom button. The button had SNCC on it, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and it also had one man, one vote. So they wear these buttons the, um, to school. The principal of the school tells these students, either take, you, you can stay here, but you got to take the button off. If you keep the button on, go home. Well, some students took the button off, but some students said, we're not taking it off. And they were dismissed. They were sent home. Well, they and their parents, got lawyers and sued, saying that uh, their First Amendment rights had been violated. This was completely novel. This was novel. They lost at the district court level, but again, a United States Court of Appeals reversed and said, well, you know, there's no evidence that the students are disrupting anything. There's no evidence that the mere wearing of this button is uh, undercutting uh, the educational mission of the high school. So, so long as the students are not disrupting anything, so, you know, they should be able to express themselves, uh, you know, at school. Well, um, there was a Supreme Court case a few years later, Tinker, versus uh, Des Moines uh, Independent School District. That case is much more famous. That was a case of involving students who were wearing an armband, armbands protesting the Vietnam War. When people think about the constitution, you know, constitutional rights for, especially for high school students, they think of Tinker. But previous to Tinker was the action taken by these black students in the Deep South. And so, one could one could go on and on with that how the struggle of black people in america has led to the betterment of society for everyone um i this is an interesting question um uh this person roland would like to know uh would you talk about your clerkship uh for thurgood marshall um in uh, what intellectual path it helped establish or guide you on. So intellectually, you know, academically speaking, that sort of thing. 
Well, like I said before, uh, clerking for Justice Marshall was one of the great highlights of my life. Um, he, his name was a name that was quite, uh, was, he, he, he was spoken of with just reverence in my household. Um, my father saw Thurgood Marshall argue a case in 1948. Very interesting case, case called Rice versus Elmore. And the, what, what the case was about in, in prior to this case, prior to, well, prior to 1947, uh, in South Carolina, black people were not permitted to participate in the primaries of the Democratic Party. Now, this was very important because, you know, South Carolina was at that time basically a one party state. Whoever the, 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 the primary was the important election, whoever won a Democratic Party primary in South Carolina, that was the person who was going to, you know, occupy the, whatever seat was being contested. And the Democratic Party of South Carolina had as one of its rules, you know, this is only for white people. That was, um, now, that was put into jeopardy by a, uh, a case Smith versus Allwright, 1944 case in which the Texas white primary was invalidated by the Supreme Court of the United States. South Carolina responded. South Carolina tried to get around Smith versus Allwright in various ways that I needn't get into here. They, but they, you know, they, they tried to evade Smith versus Allwright. And, and George Elmore, black man, sought to vote. He wasn't permitted to vote and he sued. And a federal court struck down the white primary in uh, South Carolina, where my father went to see Thurgood Marshall argue the case. And he talked a lot about just going to see Mr. Civil Rights. He was, he talked about how people would, in the deep south, you know, trouble, something would happen, you know, people would say, you know, hold on, Thurgood's coming. And so, you know, that, that's, I, I heard about Thurgood Marshall, and so when I worked for Thurgood Marshall, it was a, it was a great, uh, it was, it was, it, it was a thrill. Let me, let me go back a moment. My father was not a lawyer. My father worked in the post office. He did not really talk much about the legal issue involved in Rice versus Elmore, but he did talk about this. The thing that struck him the most, and this will, this will show how, you know, has there been change? My father was struck by the fact that the people in the courtroom called Thurgood Marshall, Mr. Marshall. That stuck in my father's mind because in the, in, in the, under the etiquette of Jim Crow, black men were not called Mr. A black physician might be called Dr. So-and-so. A black minister might be called Reverend So-and-so. But a black man just in, just, you know, ordinary, uh, parlance, what's, you know, just ordinary interaction, not called Mr. That was a big thing, not called Mr. They called Mr. Marshall. He was clearly the most impressive person in the courthouse, in the courtroom. And, you know, again, I, I heard about these. And so I worked for Justice Marshall and um, I learned a lot from him. I, uh, I asked him lots of questions. One of the great things about Justice Marshall was he, he liked, he was very willing to talk. He loved to tell stories. And his stories often had a message to them. Uh, and 
the message that he gave one of one of the one of the lessons was that you know law is important sure law is important it's not the only thing though that's important and one must be very realistic about the limits of the law he talked a lot about the limits of the law and so you know did i bring has 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 the have some of the lessons that i glean from my time with thurgood marshall have they stuck with me have they affected you know the the, the way i go about my work uh, the answer is yes um so two very timely things i want to make sure that we get to um tonight and and that are asked by uh multitude of people um so Marianne says, what is your take on voter uh, restriction laws? I, some people might not call them that, so, but we don't need to be political about that, uh, being passed around this country. Do you see these laws as race related? Um, and if so, what does it say about the future? Yeah, I guess I, I would say to that, um, how, do we, how do we approach these laws um, in regard to, I don't know, how we move forward as a country? Yeah. Well, um, you've put your finger on a very troubling development. Um, there has been an, a long-standing resistance to uh, Black participation in the political sphere. We've seen it over and over and over again, and we're seeing uh, another iteration of that. Uh, one of the things that's, I, I guess, especially troubling, uh, especially terrible, is that earlier, in the, you know, in the last century, uh, the Supreme Court certainly in the last half of the last century, the Supreme Court uh, would use its authority to, you know, strike down uh, racial disfranchisement and various ruses that amounted to racial disfranchisement. Now, Unfortunately, we have a Supreme Court of the United States that is uh, at best indifferent to these illicit efforts to um, restrict voting. The worst, of course, was its ruling of several years ago Shelby County versus Holder, when the Supreme Court of the United States eviscerated the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Uh, I, th I think that that was 2013. Um, that case, that decision, 5-4 decision, 5-4 decision, that was a judicial delinquency that will go down as one of the more disgraceful judicial delinquencies in the history of the Supreme Court. So I'm, I'm, I'm worried, I'm very worried about uh, the, the, the voting, uh, the, the, the effort to uh, discourage people from voting. Uh, is it racial? Clearly it's racial. I mean, is it, is, it, is, it, is it only race? No, it's not only race. I mean, you know, there's partisanship, partisan gerrymandering. Um, race is often not the only thing going on, but is race a big ingredient in this terrible stew? Answer, yes. Um, and briefly, and that was the other thing, and a few people had touched on this, and, and you were touching on it briefly, um, was the current uh, state of the Supreme Court. Uh, you know, there was an article today saying, you know, a justice, a conservative justice should retire to, you know, maintain, to create perhaps a better balance on the court. 
Um, and and few people are, are approaching that question and, and are talking about this here. Um, do you see a way back to parity on the Supreme Court uh, anytime soon? Um, is there a remedy? Listen, the Supreme Court of the United States is uh, at, the, at the top of one of the three branches of the federal government. It is a uh, powerful uh, law-giving institution, uh, just like the presidency, just like the Congress. It is political, just like the presidency, just like the Congress. I think a lot of people have this sentimental, you know, unrealistic notion that, uh, you know, the, the court is above politics. And of course, members of the court uh, tell the public that. They try to make the public believe that. They, uh, they, they, they are, are articulate that view, um, not it, the chief justice, the chief justice during his confirmation hearings talked about, well, the justices are, are merely umpires. They're not players, you know, ridiculous. Uh, similarly ridiculous is, you know, the statements made by um, the senior member of the liberal wing of the Supreme Court, Justice Breyer. Justice Breyer has just published a book uh, in which he talks about the perils of politics, and you know the, the the justices are are outside of politics. Again, you know, ridiculous. Um, it's a political matter. It's going to be a political struggle. The the uh, the ideological complexion of the Supreme Court of the United States will be determined uh, by political struggle. Uh, that's the way it has been. That's the way it will be. So the idea of trying to create reforms that will take the Supreme Court out of politics seems to me that that's, no, I think what you need to do is have good politics. Good politics will result in, you know, good justices who will be in favor of good policies. Uh, Will it be political? Yes, but at least it'll be good as opposed to bad. And right now, unfortunately, we are saddled with a bad, a reactionary Supreme Court that is uh, a friend, certainly a friend of uh, uh, big business, a friend of those on top, a friend of, you know, the, frankly, some of the worst aspects of our status quo, and it's indifferent or unfriendly, uh, certainly to organized labor, unfriendly toward people who have been uh, marginalized, unfriendly towards people who are trying to change our country in a substantial way. Uh, ways that are, are, are very needed. We need substantial change. And um, the Supreme Court, unfortunately, as presently constituted, is going to stand in the way. It's going to be an obstacle. It's going to be an impediment. It's not going to be a source of uh, assistance for those who are trying to reform our country, uh, though our country is so deeply in need of uh, reform. Well, I think this is a great lead into our very last question here from Denise. And uh, it, it's good to end on a note like this. What, what makes you stay optimistic, she asks. Well, I'm gonna end with a story involving Justice Marshall. Near the end of the 1983-84 term, there was a case, I, I believe it was, it was a death penalty case. Justice Marshall had very deep feelings. He was a death penalty abolitionist. He thought that the, the, the uh, death penalty was unconstitutional. And he said that. In any event, there was a death penalty case and uh, the prisoner was, had exhausted uh, all of his uh, legal avenues for you know, for all of his all of his pleas for relief had been denied, and I was talking with the justice, and I says, "Well, I said, Justice Marshall, 
you really are on the losing end of a lot of the things that are most important to you. Don't you get discouraged? And he said to me, he said two things. He said, number one, he said, you know, you should remember that in much of my career as an attorney, with respect to equal protection cases, my lead case was Plessy versus Ferguson, separate but equal. So, you know, everybody now, you know, Plessy versus Ferguson, terrible, you know, the, the idea of separate but equal, bad, bad, bad. But he said, you know, I, I, I tried to wring out as much equality from that myth, that terrible myth of separate but equal. I tried to wring out as much equality as I could. And he did ring out. He, you know, he, he, even with Plessy versus Ferguson, he was able to, he was able to advance a bit. So you remember that, even when you're being dealt bad cards, even when things are really against you, even under those circumstances, you can find, you can find tools to use to advance. Then secondly, he said, remember, this is not a sprint. This is a marathon. So am I discouraged? No, I'm not discouraged. Um, I'm, you know, sometimes I get disappointed, but this, you, you, you got to take the long view and you got to keep pushing. And I've taken that on board. I think that's a good way of viewing things. Well, thank you. And I can't think of a better way to end tonight. And uh, I'd like to thank you for joining us and thank everybody at home. And um, yeah, we encourage you to purchase the book. It's called Say It Loud. And uh, Professor Kennedy, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Really appreciated it.